Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. We're going to get started in just a few moments here. Thank you. Hi everyone, good afternoon again. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to get started in just another minute. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Casey Murphy, and I am Axe Events and Programs Manager. Welcome to our last webinar of our 20, 2017 series entitled Opening the Toolbox to Maximize the Benefits of Park and Ride Facilities. Presenting on today's topic is Jonathan Brooks, Todd Hansen, and Zachary Elgart from the Texas A&M Transportation Institute. Today's webinar is in partnership with Axe Red River Chapter. They brought the topic to our attention and I want to thank them, thank the chapter for partnering with us and I also want to encourage anyone listening today that might have a possible topic or an idea for a future webinar to reach out to me over the next month as we begin to finalize, finalize our uh, 2018 lineup. I'd also like to add that Axe Call for Speakers is now open for our 2018 International Conference in Anaheim, California, July 29th through August 1st. If you have a presentation topic that you think will challenge, inspire, and provide actionable content to our 500 plus attendees, we definitely want you to submit a proposal. Visit our conference website at actconf.org backslash 2018 for more information and to submit a proposal. Now just a few housekeeping reminders before I turn it over to our moderator. First, as a reminder, this call is being recorded and you will be able to download it on the ACT website under the Events and Programs section by tomorrow afternoon. Secondly, everyone is muted on today's call, so if you do have a question for any of our speakers, please click on the questions, question mark sign to the left of your name and type in your question there. If there is someone specific you'd like to ask the question to, please add the person's name um, it should go to as well. We will do our best to address all questions during the Q&A portion at the end of the three presentations. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce today's moderator, Craig Cotton, Axe Red River Chapter President. Craig has 16 years in the transportation and parking industries. He began his career at Texas Tech as a student in 1993. His time as a student, Craig came back to Texas Tech as an employee in 2001. He started his career at Tech in the parking enforcement side of things, and in 2008, took a position as Transportation Demand Management Supervisor in the same department there. 
Craig joined ACT in 2010 and became president of the Red River Chapter in 2015. Please join me in welcoming our moderator for this afternoon, Craig Cotton. Thanks, Casey. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Casey said, we're going to be speaking on the um, operations of a well-run park and ride facility. I want to start us off with just a little bit of a little short story uh, that kind of illustrates the the importance of of um, a well-run park and ride facility. So a colleague of mine, he had just started at uh, Texas State University as the director of transportation and parking there. And upon his employment, he was told that the university was under a parking crunch. And he's driving around one day, and he drives past a parking lot that's empty. <clears throat> and he can't understand why in the world there would be an empty parking lot uh, with the university on a parking crunch. So he goes to his parking guy. He asks him, he goes, hey, you know, why is this parking lot over here at the edge of campus empty? Uh, he goes, and the parking guy tells him, he goes, because there, there aren't buses that run to that parking lot. So he goes to his bus guy, his transportation guy, and he goes, hey, you know, I was just talking to the parking guy. Uh, why are there not buses that run to this empty, this uh, parking lot? And the transportation guy goes, well, but it's because nobody parks there. So, as you can see, there's an importance in how a uh, park and ride facility is run uh, and how it can easily fail um, without the proper uh, utilization in, in place. So we're going to move on to our presenters. Uh, we're going to move through this fairly quickly. So to leave uh, hopefully plenty of time for uh, any questions that you may have. Uh, our first presenter, his name is Jonathan Brooks. Jonathan is an assistant research scientist with TTI's Transit, Transit Mobility Program located in Houston, Texas. He's an active young professional researcher interested in public transportation policy planning and measurement. Jonathan often analyzes the operational cost societal benefit cost and performance of various forms of public transit or HOV, HOT lanes. He has conducted onboard passenger surveys, university student transportation surveys, agency stakeholder surveys, regional commuter and employer surveys, and surveys as part of uh, transit community st case studies. He leads a study of commuter and employer preferences in the greater Houston region aimed at managing congestion and improving air quality through travel demand management. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Brooks. Jonathan? I thank you for that introduction, Craig. Uh, I'll make sure to give a shorter bio next time. Um, and thanks for sharing that story. Often, what we'll present today, we often heard uh, interesting, somewhat simple stories where it's a matter of communication and developing more effective uh, use of park and facilities that already exist or that may exist in the future. What we will present today, my two colleagues and I, represents is all the information we will present is found in TCRP Report 192, which is a guidebook on planning and managing park and ride. And we very much, as a research team, did focus on both the planning and the active management of existing parking facilities and the repurposing of those. The report, um, we at TTI led the development of the port, but we had strong partners with Kittleson and Associates Incorporated. Paul Rias led their effort and Catherine Koffel Consulting. And as a team, we worked the last three years in close concert with a panel of, um, Casey, I'm trying to click forward on the slide. It's not advancing. Okay. Uh, just a moment. Can we just... Okay. The TCRP panel for the oversight of the project that you can see on the screen. We're not going to go through all these names. I'd like to especially recognize the efforts of Diane Schwager in leading this. The, she was a TRB senior program officer that liaised on the study and main, and the product, the information we can share with you is was strongly influenced by the panel. They were very active, had excellent feedback and probably and uh, provided a lot of direction for the research. The webinar is organized as follows. I will, I will briefly introduce the guidebook, explain the intent of how it's organized, et cetera, and then I will talk also about strategic planning for park and ride facilities. Then I will turn the time over to my colleague, Todd Hansen, to, operate, to speak about operating park and ride and 
the matter of charging for parking. And then Zachary Elgart will conclude the, the webinar by speaking about Park and Ride and the community and the topics that fall under there. So the introduction to the guidebook. We we'll first like to relate the, the goals for this research and the guidebook that informed the purpose of the guidebook. We wanted, the aim was to create a single resource of strategies and best practices that would relate to the entire lifespan of a facility from concept, from early planning through to repurposing, reuse, redevelopment, or continued maintenance. We wanted, as part of that, we wanted to explore every aspect of that and present that in a logical format and uh, specifically uh, provide a resource of best practices. And all of this is based on case study examples, real life examples that we as a research team identified through the project. I know I'm mostly speaking to the choir here, so I won't labor the point of what is park and ride, except to say that uh, it can be many things. And so if you think of park and ride in one form being a more formal parking lot, like on, as in the image here, it, it can also be many things. It can be a small number of spaces uh, systematically placed near a, a line of stations on a service, or uh, it can be a garage, it can be purchased, leased, uh, operated by contract. There's a lot of context in which park ride is, is provided to transit riders, but that the, the key here is that parking is ancillary to the transit service. It's provided to facilitate the transit rider's use of the transit service. Um, we often refer to park and ride as a transit mode, and, and it is. I use it myself three or four times a week, but um, the transit mode is not the parking. It's to facilitate use, and so how can we better do that as an industry is something we were looking at. Why provide parking? Now, this is a... There are, this is less simple to answer. Depends on the agency, their, their goals and purposes for park and ride. Um, but you can see some on the screen here to concentrate demand for transit, to pull in a, a different market of transit riders that then can be attracted without the presence of parking. Um, can facilitate carpool, van pool, those other, those other modes. Um, and some regions, incentivize it or pursue it because it allows them to manage demand for the larger infrastructure for transportation to reduce or manage vehicle miles traveled or target air quality goals. And um, in some cases, and maybe it's quite often the case, it's a strategy to manage or to shift parking location out of a highly concentrated employment or activity center uh, into more convenient or accessible locations for drivers and then you free up space in the central location. The purposes of park and ride in your context, wherever each of you operate or work or concentrate your research and uh, your operations will vary, but we are confident that the guidebook addresses many of these and provides information that then can help you in your work. The guidebook was developed first through, through an iterative process where we first looked at what's the existing information through a literature review. Then we conducted a cursory but comprehensive scan of the industry with a very brief survey instrument and using of other available inventories of park and ride facilities and, and operators. Then we followed that up with a series of mini case studies where we asked, uh, we, we, we used systematic protocol to collect, trying to standardize the information we collect on, a, on about 40 agencies um, across the country, and in fact, uh, one in Canada, and to document the general practices and trends. And at that point, then, we met with the panel, the TCRP panel, and decided what are the, where should we target further full case studies, and what are their specific topics or aspects of the research we need to focus on. And we identified 16 further agencies to, to go into more depth. And most of those were full case studies, meaning we looked at every topic we were investigating from the, over the whole lifespan of a, of a park and ride facility. And then a few were targeted. For exa an example of a targeted facility uh, case study would be BART's, um, an in-depth targeted case study looking at charging for parking. 
and, dyna and dynamic pricing of charging for parking. All of this information, the, if, you're, if you're an individual who loves to uh, look for the detail, the TCRP web-only document 69 is a 500-page full research report that documents verbatim all of the findings from this. In fact, with the full case studies, you would see uh, for each of those case studies, their full answers edited, but in, in essence complete. So you might find that interesting if you're trying to tackle a very specific problem and you think there's a peer that we case studied, then we might have the answer or at least something for you to start from. All of that was used to develop the, the, the guidebook. I won't, I won't labor this too much here, but the state of the practice scan, we did uh, contact 186 agencies that APTA had already created a database of. 83 responded. Most were large urban, although some were small urban, and we had one rural. The agencies represented those with fewer than 300 spaces to those operators with more than 50,000, and all transit modes. You see on the map here that those case studies, the, that scan then allowed us to do our case studies. The red dots are full case studies. An average full case study is 10 to 15 pages of interview-based content and database content. And the blue case studies were targeted on topics which are then documented in the, in the guidebook. So the whole purpose of that is to explain that we believe the guidebook has valid current information about park and ride. You can use the guidebook one of two ways. You could go cover to cover, as is most reports, but we also strove to make it subject specific where you could turn to particular chapters and get good information on more topical topics. And um, I'm going to go ahead and go forward here to the illustration in the format of uh, as kind of maps we often see with transit services that chapter one and two provide the introduction, the overview. Three and four are the conceptual, that what do you think about when you're looking at planning and the financial planning for the operation for the construction and then operation of a facility. Then you work your way down through the life cycle of a park and ride and you get to the design phase. What, what are the considerations for design and implementation? And then operation, <clears throat> pardon me, chapters six through eight, which also take into account adaptation, enhancement, things, once, things you need to consider once you're in operation. The guidebook concludes with a chapter about asset management and state of good repair. And then uh, we discuss in the final chapter evolution of park and ride and the park and ride industry. That's how the guidebook is organized in a very logical progression, but you could pick out particular chapters and the chapters are uh, work, work well enough on their own also. Those resources, the, the guidebook and the web only document are all available on TCRP's website and uh, in PDF format. And if you want to order a copy, they generally require a fee for that now. I will now transition and briefly talk about strategic planning. This would constitute chapters one and two of the guidebook, the real strategic planning, long-range planning, and then also financial planning, although I, today I will focus more on the strategic planning elements and less on the financial planning, although that's in the guidebook. So there are five types, uh, topics, I will briefly talk about master and long-range planning as opposed to project-specific planning. And then with those, there's always a need to estimate demand for parking. The guidebook addresses that topic. Um, and then facility types and ownership and how the decision-making process at your agency or agencies you may work with or for, um, it matters if it's owned versus shares and it varies agency to agency, but we synthesize findings about each of these topics. So, master and long-range planning. There are several examples on screen. I won't labor those, but that, that often this is the point at which you're trying to identify the sites for one or more parking facilities, or if parking is uh, attached to or part of developing a station or a transit center, a transfer station, what would you consider about specifically the parking elements and the policies that will govern them over the lifespan of the, the proposed facility? And uh, each of these are, of course, discussed. Examples of those, uh, you can see 
that then process, so looking long term then helps you identify what the relationship might be between several facilities with parking along a particular route or line uh, or type of service and or through a network. Project planning then gets you to the specific site. And it can be on an ad hoc basis or it can be part of that orchestrated master plan. The, some of the keys are you must identify the need for parking, specifically the parking element. And what we often often found in case studies is that um, you can identify a need, and often the need you identify may actually see your ability to provide parking. That doesn't mean you should not build the facility. It just means that um, alternative access modes, uh, pedestrian, bike, transit services that coincide with the facility may be, become more important. If you're constrained, you might uh, develop some of your own parking internally, but then contract or lease spaces and nearby facilities and or simply live with the fact that the lot may reach 100% utilization many days. You also may identify alternatives to provide a parking ways to increase your capacity. I just mentioned some of those. And, the, and that process can inform the implementation process. For example, UTA, Utah Transit Authority in 2014 used a park and ride lot master plan and it covers all aspects of this. It would be a great example for you go you can refer to. Estimating demand, there are several mount, uh, models which you can use. Some are more elaborate than others. Some are simply a spreadsheet that gives you a cursory look at it. Um, park and ride, uh, the, the image illustrates that park and ride often has a catchment area. This catchment area varies if it's an independent facility operating on its own versus a series of facilities on the same travel corridor. All of this is discussed in the guidebook and those models are each um, there's a snapshot of each model, the resources needed to use that model. The, the, the crux of all this is to right size the facility for your riders, future or current. Facility types and ownership. We found that there's the transit industry, the parking industry rather, this is larger than transit, often there are aspects of this that would matter not just to transit operators but um, business districts, management districts, travel demand managers working uh, with various large employers, but especially we focused on transit as they're often developing uh, capital investments. However, that said, some lease, many lease spaces, um, or share their facilities, so it's, it's a hybrid facility. Um, that can be with simply other adjacent employers uh, or between transit operators that are coordinated or simply between um, other government entities or other uh, purposes, special event facilities. Decision making though in terms of owned versus shares, it, you have to take into account the level of control that your agency requires for the type of services you operate, the level of parking, the sensitivity or the security of, of the location might matter, um, the level of investment required to maintain uh, to construct and maintain a facility, and future flexibility. You can take into it with an owned facility, you might construct it new and future-proof it. For example, in Houston Metro, they build, they often will install several extra conduits if it's a garage to the different levels that um, if you needed to in the future add capacity for electric vehicle charging or some other things, you, you can then adapt more e easily. So. Those are things to consider. Shared uh, use agreements can reduce the impact of uncertainty. If you need as an agency to limit your capital cost up front, you can begin that way and proof uh, demand for your services. We had uh, some, some case study highlights are that uh, BART and Houston Metro both own and generally operate lots, um, whereas CTA and Metro tend to own the lot but contract operation and management of the lot. And the third route of that is New, New Jersey Transit, Sound Transit, um, lease the space from private or public entities. Again, all these findings are discussed in the guidebook. I will now turn the time over uh, back to Craig Cotton, our moderator, to introduce my colleague Todd and uh, to continue the webinar by speaking about the next topic. Thanks, Jonathan. That's really good stuff, man. So we're going to move right on into the next uh, presenter, 
His name is Todd Hansen. Todd is an associate transportation researcher for the Transit Mo Mobility Program at the Texas A&M Transportation Institute, also known as TTI, and has five years of transportation experience. Todd's work focuses on best practices for public transportation agencies, accessibility for persons with disabilities to fixed route transit, innovative practices between public transit and transportation network companies, GTFS data for research and trip planning, and analysis of transit agency operational and financial data. Todd has created tools to project fleet capacity and vehicle uses, usage for special events and to prioritize bus stop accessibility improvements based on bus stop, bus stop inventory and trip demand data. Mr. Hansen routinely assists transit agencies in reporting and benchmarking, developing fleet management plans, and workshop trainings across Texas. He regularly, regularly researches emerging, emerging partnerships and service agreements between public transit agencies and private transportation network companies, also known as TNCs, and has presented on the topic at the Association for Commuter Transportation International Conference. Todd earned a master's in ur urban planning from Texas A&M University and is certified by the American Institute of Certified Planners. Welcome. Uh, please join me in welcoming Todd Hansen. Thank you very much, Craig. And I think my bio is a little long, too, but I appreciate uh, that. <laughs> Um, so with this next section, uh, operating, and par operating Park and Ride, um, there's a lot of material, um, so I'm going to go through it quickly, but uh, please um, refer to the guidebook chapters, as Jonathan was saying, um, for more specific details. Um, operating a Park and Ride facility is an ongoing and dynamic process, and transit agencies must uh, carefully consider how to approach their Park and Ride management. Um, these are the list of uh, topics that are um, within this section, and as I noted, um, there's um, additional topics in the guidebook, um, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, um, that I'll go through as well. Um, as you can see, there's a long list of um, ongoing operating and maintenance needs involved more than just maintaining the parking surface, and in addition, uh, the facilities require act active enforcement of rules and proactive efforts to maintain, um, maintain them and improve security, um, as well as regular inspections to detect any security operations or maintenance issues before they result in significant problems. Um, so an overarching theme uh, with operating park and ride is that regardless of who owns the facility or who operates the facility, from the customer's perspective, it is the park and ride that is part of their trip. Um, and therefore, uh, their interpretation is that um, the park and ride is representative of the transit provider. So with this in mind, um, keep in mind that from the customer's perspective, the park and ride is a touch point between the customer and the agency. And all aspects of operating a park and ride should be carefully managed with the same level of attention to detail as a transit agency would to um, any other amenity. Um, with managing a park and ride, a transit agency, of course, must um, ensure a, a high level of quality um, for the customer experience. Um, the uh, transit agency employee or group of employees uh, must take responsibility for the ongoing management and oversight of the park and ride program, um, whether it is um, it's centralized into a single department or distributed under um, several departments, there need to be clear lines of um, responsibility, the ownership, and processes in place. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, in in-house and contracted, contracted environments, um, but um, these processes should be in place um, in either, either environment and setup of departments. Um, with regulating facility use, uh, uh, um, there's a uh, you know, obviously rules for the, the designation of spaces and authorized usage that transit agencies um, must put in place. And um, along with adopting a system-wide parking policy, uh, the transit agency may choose to set specific rules for um, individual facilities, um, whether they want to promote or prohibit certain types of parking usage at um, certain areas, um, whether some lots should allow for longer-term parking or um, parking during special events and such like that, um, where certain designated spaces should be. So those are the type of um, rules that might be set for specific specific lots as opposed to a system-wide policy. 
Um, displaying rules is a crucial component of managing park and rides. Um, otherwise, it may make um, it more difficult to actually enforce those rules that you have set. Um, the, your rules should be uh, displayed using a robust combination of um, different tools such as signage and highly visible locations like this example here um, from King County Metro. Um, maybe printing, uh, printing your rules on the parking receipts or fare tickets um, as well as uh, brochures and website info as well. Um, with enforcing rules, transit agencies can either handle that through their own police force, local police force, or transit agency staff. Uh, depending on who they determine uh, to be most appropriate with their operational setup. And uh, rules may need to be modified uh, periodically as well, and the modification of those rules should be the same uh, uh, people responsible for that oversight. Um, there's a lot under um, utilities and maintenance um, within these park and ride facilities. Like any other facility, um, they require ongoing maintenance and provision um, of payment for any applicable utilities that occur. Um, specific needs may vary for maintenance uh, across facilities, but most facilities for park and ride need um, attention to the following uh, items, the list you see on your page. Um, lighting and electricity. Uh, most facilities have lighting uh, in the parking area as well as with the transit boarding areas. Um, so that's, that's an ongoing um, uh, uh, provision that needs to be accounted for. Um, also, electricity may be used to power things like security cameras, vending machines, and other equipment at the, at the lot. And with that, um, with lighting, um, there are additional expenses from labor that come from um, inspection, maintenance, and replacement um, of those as well. Um, cleaning is obviously important for, for aesthetic uh, reasons and comfort at the facility. And so various, uh, the frequency of a cleaning task uh, will depend on um, the intensity of the facility and how, how it's used, um, how often it's used and other local environmental factors. Um, but transit agencies should sweep and remove litter on a frequent basis, and in some cases this may be um, a daily activity they do. Um, same goes for trash removal as well. Um, most transit agencies do report um, trash receptacles as a typical amenity um, at park and ride facilities, so um, uh, something to keep in mind with cleaning as well. And then other facility upkeep, uh, maybe things like benches, shelters, signs, pavement markings, um, sidewalks, et cetera. Um, and those are things that need to be maintained with um, uh, repainting or, or refurbishing uh, if, if lots need to be restriped or um, landscaping as well. Um, one of the uh, best practices findings that is in the guidebook as well is um, being able to reduce maintenance, co maintenance costs through um, strategic planning of those, um, of those factors at the sites. Um, New Jersey Transit is an example of an agency that um, uses low maintenance uh, native planning, native planting uh, at, their, at their facilities, and so they, um, that reduces their maintenance costs uh, by planning that. Um, with security and enforcement, um, in addition to being a, a design issue for security, it's also largely an operational issue. Um, depending on a transit agency's context, security and parking enforcement may be managed with um, either the same personnel or um, separate personnel between security and um, the enforcement side of things. Um, On-site security um, is, is found to be most appropriate when security risks are high at a specific location, um, but, if, but it's not commonly used at park and rides, or at least at all park and ride locations. Um, the guidebook and, and case studies found that a more efficient strategy for on-site security is to have roaming patrols that move from facility to, to facility so that you have a, a um, security presence, um, but you're able to, to um, you know, reduce costs based on need that way. Um, also, remote security is a common approach to um, providing security at the park and ride facilities through both um, closed circuit televisions uh, where you can use video recordings of an event or incident um, to, to look at what happened and it, and it provides a presence of security as well. And uh, call boxes at the facility sites themselves. Um, of course, with both of these things, call boxes and closed circuit televisions, they need to be maintained and, um, and usable at all times. Um, with security inspections, those need to be um, performed regularly by 
um, the the department responsible for those. Um, a lot of times it can be the, the trans agency police um, department themselves. Uh, but with these inspections, uh, it's important that um, checking for adequate lighting in all areas of the facility, ensuring that the cameras um, have unobstructed views, um, that uh, directional and regulatory signage is visible um, for, for people at the facility, and checking for any areas that are concealed or hidden from plain view is important as well. Um, again, parking enforcement you know, can be done um, uh, through either the same security people or a different, uh, different group as well. Uh, but these are enforcing parking for um, different space uses, such as handicapped spaces, special designated spaces, um, and looking for overnight parked or abandoned vehicles um, according to your policy. So this is the um, operations approach spectrum um, that we have with um, either fully contracted uh, con contracted operations all the way over to fully managed in-house operations. Um, in-house operations will require additional internal staff and resources, but gives the agency more direct control, whereas contracted operations will require fewer, fewer internal staff, but thereby reduce the trans agency's direct control. So there are strengths and challenges to um, two different approaches with staffing and resource requirements, the level of control the agency has, and, and the cost um, as well. But even when parking management is contracted, uh, transit agencies must still be proactive to ensure a high quality customer experience. Um, in all of these cases, uh, the responsibility for a successful parking program still falls on the transit agency um, through management of these processes. And this uh, table on this page shows um, a framework for helping transit agencies in the decision-making process uh, between in-house and contracted operations that's in the guidebook. Um, this framework doesn't replace uh, an agency's local knowledge or expertise of their, of their operations and environment, but it may help guide in the overall process. Um, so the framework can be used to, for a transit agency to score themselves um, on a spectrum between each of these two extremes um, for each of the attributes in the framework. Um, and if the bulk of scores lean towards one approach, then it may mean the transit agency and its, in its operating context are more conducive to, to that approach for that aspect of their service. Um, with managing uh, demand for parking, uh, different agencies use um, a few different performance metrics that the, the guidebook and case studies found. Um, the most common one um, that's generally accepted by transit agencies is parking utilization, uh, which is the percentage of parking spaces occupied out of all the available parking spaces um, at the facility and group of facilities. Um, in general, uh, agencies uh, say that when a parking ride, park and ride approaches between 80 and 90 percent utilization uh, during their peak operating times, they consider the facility to be full. Um, other metrics that are found in the guidebook as well, um, and you can see on the slide, are um, the cost per um, space, as the examples in the table show, um, as well as access to mode share um, at different facilities. There we go. The strategies to uh, reduce or um, shift demand, uh, like the example that um, uh, uh, Craig was talking about at the beginning with the story. Um, with any, any of these strategies that are on um, the, the, the slide in front of you, um, they basically fall between two options. Uh, you can either expand capacity uh, by, by leasing parking spaces, adding parking spaces at the facility, or building a new facility, or you can reduce demand at um, a given facility and try to shift it to a less utilized um, park and ride facility. Um, so one way to do this is um, increasing the availability of information to um, customers. Uh, the, one of the, the images there shows a, um, a variable message sign at a facility entrance with uh, the amount of available parking spaces. Um, so making sure these are um, having these and, and uh, making them available at um, uh, high utilized lots to see where parking um, is, is, 
is still available. Um, also, having information available through a transit agency at your app or um, your website, um, maybe having a social media account to push out information um, could be um, useful as well. Um, so there's different ways to make that information available um, in, in real time um, as customers need it. Um, with uh, uh, different parking regulations, you can enact to ensure that the lot is being used by um, daily transit riders um, alone. That can help with, with parking, uh, park and ride demand uh, so that your transit users are, are using it. Um, and uh, if you have a, a goal to have spaces available during your, your off-peak times during the day, you can reserve specific spaces so that they're available for customers uh, arriving after 10 a.m. Um, other strategies include uh, restriping of lots to maximize available space um, and encouraging other drive alone um, alternative uh, alternatives to drive, driving alone to get to um, the park and ride facility. So next I'm going to move into charging for parking. Um, for, and this is for when agencies choose to charge uh, parking uh, separately from from their their fare costs. Um, not not uh, it's completely dependent on on the transit agency situation whether or not they they charge, and it depends on their agency goals as well. Um, these are the topics that we'll go through in this section. Um, charging for parking can offset costs and assist with managing demand uh, for your available lots. Um, but despite uh, these, these benefits, uh, charging for parking does present challenges as well. Um, that when you charge for parking, it means you must enforce payment, uh, manage ridership impacts uh, in terms of possibly discouraging people from parking at the site, uh, planning logistics for fee collection, and um, keeping customer relations uh, in mind as well. So these are some of the reasons that a transit agency may choose to charge for parking, and I, I mentioned a couple of them already in, in terms of managing demand, um, encouraging uh, different modes of access to the lot, and generating revenue. Uh, whatever the reasons that an agency chooses to charge for parking, uh, the agency should establish uh, policy guidance um, and expectations that guide their parking fees program and complement the objectives of the transit agency uh, when it chooses to, to elect to charge for parking. Um, parking charges at, at park and ride facilities can generate um, significant revenue, particularly in areas with uh, higher population density, uh, higher land values, and um, generally if there are higher um, central business district parking costs um, as well. Um, one of the case study findings we have is WMATA in DC. Uh, they're actually able to fund their park and ride program in its entirety um, from their their parking fee revenue um, and, and cover their expenses. But that's you know due to their their specific um, setting and situation. Um, with the you know the challenges, uh, some of them I mentioned already as well. Um, with charging for parking fees, keep in mind that these parking fees. Um, it may discourage ridership, particularly in low demand areas, uh, may result in hide and ride behavior from people um, you know, parking nearby and, 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 and dodging um, the park and ride lot, um, and then you know, creating additional logistics to manage and um, uh, you know, potentially the cost of the program um, that you implement could outweigh the, the revenue and benefits. Uh, that you are trying to to realize from the fees, so um, this needs to be something that's carefully considered. Ah, yes, this case study example, um, you know, we have that. Um, oh, I skipped ahead without even realizing it. So, with um, setting the amount of uh, parking charges, um, the effectiveness of using parking fees as a um, demand management tool depends largely on your local context, as I uh, alluded to a little bit already. Uh, when you are in a region with se severe traffic congestion and high downtown parking rates, um, if you charge for, for park and ride fees, it may have little to no impact on the parking uh, demand. Um, and to incentivize shifting parking from overutilized to underutilized facilities, 
uh, the parking fee difference has to be substantial enough that customers are willing to change their commute pattern um, to, to drive to or to, to access the, the less expensive park and ride lot. Um, with this case study finding that we have, um, BART is actually able to charge uh, market rates for the parking facility that is closest to, um, to downtown San Francisco um, because, uh, because the density is, is so high. Um, Title VI uh, concerns, uh, transit agencies aren't required to conduct an analysis for parking fees the way they would with uh, transit fare equity analysis, but agencies may choose to consider uh, the equity for charging for parking as well. Um, it's um, you know, it, it's um, you know a, a good practice to potentially keep in mind. Um, requires you know documentation as with a fare equity uh, Title VI policy would notices to the public. Um, instructions for filing complaints and, and having a, a public participation plan. Um, but with this Title VI analysis, you'll, you'll be able to um, uh, figure out if there is a disparate impact um, from, um, from charging for parking and, and make sure that the transit service delivery is consistent with Title VI goals for non-discrimination. Um, within the guidebook, uh, Sound Transit is an example of an agency that, that did a title, title VI analysis specifically on, on parking fees. Um, with methods for collecting fares, um, keep in mind that each method for collecting fees uh, costs the transit agency something to implement, uh, operate, and maintain, um, and thereby will in some way reduce the net revenue that you would get from parking fees. So um, on-site staff, uh, whether they're in-house or contracted, they may be necessary at, at some facilities, uh, um, depending on the specific issues at the facility, but will obviously be more costly to have staff members there. Um, other, some of the noted self-service options for, for paying parking fees and collecting them include uh, ticket vending machines, payment kiosks, uh, automated driveway gates, like we see in this picture, um, and then also online mobile and smartphone payment options. And so to wrap this up, some of the elements of success for um, charging for parking include uh, proper enforcement of your, your parking rules and, and fees, um, coordinating with other, other providers, managing um, spillover from, from your parking um, lot to, to other neighboring lots and your relationships with customers. Um, another uh, part of this could be um, emerging technologies, um, depending on your specific situation, could help with um, um, your, your parking fee strategy. Um, with mobile payments, um, that's, that's a emerging way for, for customers to be able to have uh, that payment option. Uh, Denver RTD, as it shows as an example, um, they have a payment option that uh, tracks parking fees based on the license plate number. Um, so that's, that's pretty innovative. Um, and dynamic pricing is also a way to help um, have real-time real -time pricing that, that fluctuates based on uh, the utilization of specific facilities um, and, and try to encourage, again, that shifting from overutilized facilities to underutilized facilities. So now I will uh, turn it back to Craig. Thanks, Todd. It's fantastic stuff, man. Our next presenter is Zachary Elgart. Zach has six years of transportation res uh, research experience and is responsible for a diverse range of products or projects as an assistant research scientist with TTI's Transit Mobility Program. His interests and efforts focus on innovation, accessibility, inclusion of technology, and automated, uh, automation and transportation, alternative and active modes, pub public health, alternative funding, innovative finance, and urban design. Mr. Elgart was the principal investigator on a two-year project that investigated the potential to improve connection to goods and services for rural residents by coordinating last-mile packages via uh, delivery via rural uh, transit operators. He was the principal investigator on a project focused on the opportunity to enhance roadway safety via transportation network companies. Uh, this project studied the relationship between TNCs and alcohol impaired driving to identify opportunities and generate scenarios to incentivize or increase the use of TNCs instead of driving and enhance an innovative com connection to the community. Please join me in welcoming Zachary Elgart. Zach.
All right. Well, thank you, Craig, and uh, thank you, Todd and Jonathan, for leading the way on this. Um, so this last section is is going to touch on how park and rides uh, interact with the community that they um, are a part of, and just a couple key components of that, um, such as more information about some real-time parking information, how to engage the community and some of the benefits of that, and then dealing with adjacent land uses, um, including TOD. Um, I'm going to keep it real short so we can get to questions. If anybody has specific questions about these topics that I might not touch on, um, put them in the chat box now and we can get to them uh, during the questions. So to begin with, uh, we'll talk about some impacts. Um, Todd mentioned hide and ride. That's where you might park in the neighborhood. Uh, also here referred to as spillover parking. But you also um, have to consider things like traffic congestion, uh, impacts of noise and lighting, environmental uh, considerations, both for um, local residents and larger environmental considerations related to traffic. Um, so when implementing a park and ride, these are the types of things that you want to consider and you want to talk to the community about um, so you can get their input on you know, what the impacts of maybe an existing park and ride are so you can address those in a new park and ride or how to mitigate them moving forward in other ways. Um, one of the things we learned in the case studies was that LA Metro actually assesses off-site traffic impacts uh, in the areas around where they're considering park and rides to see if they can even put one in or are they going just to get, create a real problem. Um, Real-time parking is a great way to interact with a community where a park and ride exists. Um, Todd touched on this a little bit, but real-time parking can give people information about the facility well ahead of their arrival. And then when they get there, they also would know maybe where, they're, where they need to head if it's a very large facility, as in this example here in the image, or if maybe they need to move on to the next one if it's already full in the, between the time they, they left the house and the time they got there. So managing expectations. Um, again, you can, you can present it via a lot of different sources. And as with everything information these days, um, there's multiple routes to the same solution. Um, DART and MARTA are both examples of, of agencies that use this type of information. DART goes very simple. They use a mobile messaging sign that they put out at, at park and rides that are experiencing high volume. Uh, and then, you know, if, it, if that volume changes, they can move it. Um, MARTA provides information on their website. Um, some general points about community engagement. Uh, when, it, when you're looking at new facilities, incorporating public feedback from the very beginning is really important. You need to know how the community feels about a park and ride going in maybe near their house or maybe near their business uh, and marketing. So marketing also provides an uh, aspect of education. It also introduces people to this new service and hopefully generates ridership. Uh, if you are expanding uh, Data about the need or the demand of the facility is really important, and you can gather that sometimes via surveys. Um, but then you also need to assess the impacts or benefits to the neighbors. So going back to some of those initial impacts, is there going to be spillover if you increase the size of the facility? Um, another way to engage the community is to share the facility. So as you can see in this picture here, there's a, there's a farmer's market going on that's actually in a, in a parking lot. Um, you can also do other community events. Sometimes you can have other businesses come and share the location. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more of that in the next slides. Also, just ongoing communication is really important. I'm jumping through kind of quick. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. Um, considering adjacent land uses is a key part of this whole communication um, aspect, you know, dealing with the community. So as you can see in this example, RTA has actually identified that they have a hotel nearby. Um, so talking about additional amenities you might have on site or, or near, maybe you share a parking, a parking lot with an existing use. Um, oftentimes movie theaters are a good example of this. In the day you park in the parking lot, in the evening uh, you go to the movies. Um, so partnering with local businesses, uh, you can also catalyze joint development. Um, and a, one way that that might come to fruition is through transit-oriented development. So this is basically bringing the community to the transit in a way. Um, it can generate a return on investment by using property that the transit agency owns to either lease or sell to a developer to create either housing or offices or both. Um, you can partner with, with private sector or other public sector entities to maintain a facility. 
and it generates a bunch of other benefits. I mentioned ridership. Um, sometimes it can help to increase property values around the area. Um, as with BART, they've seen an a increase in rents both for office and uh, residential uses near their stations, which is helping to promote TOD, one of which is a uh, picture. This is a, a plan facility. So that was a very, very quick go through of Park and Ride and um, the community. I'm going to turn it back to Craig to sort of moderate some questions or maybe Casey. Um, but thank yeah. you all for the time. That was great. Thank you very much, Zach. That was quick, but uh, very good and very helpful. Thank you. Um, Craig, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay. Uh, we do have a couple questions here for you guys. Um, feel free to jump in and answer where you can. Um, this first one I know kind of was addressed by you, Todd, a little bit, but if you guys have anything to add, uh, what did your studies find in Denver at the RTD where park and ride locations charge additional fees for residents outside the immediate area of the PNR? For many, especially those without annual transit passes, found it price prohibitive to use park and ride. That's a quite a specific question uh, and <laughs> interesting. Off, this is Jonathan. Off the top of my head, I don't, I don't know that I have a specific answer for that. We could go refer to our case study. Todd or Zach, can you all recall what we learned well, about that? My, my understanding of the Denver situation is that they charge for parking for users from outside of the RTD service area because they they believe that people within the service area have already paid for that parking as part of what they pay for service, taxes and, and otherwise. So they charge people who live outside of the service area as a way of recovering some of those costs. It's one of the, the it's the other equity, it's the equity and cost sharing as opposed to the equity that we typically think of with race, minorities, low income folks, that sort of thing. Um, that's my understanding of their strategy in Denver. The, okay. the question becomes, is it is it worth the effort? Does it uh, create the outcome they're looking for? Are they, they recover funds, but are they building a relationship with those residents outside their service area such that maybe in the future the agency could expand service area based on a vote? And that becomes a question. Um, we'd have to go look at our full, the web, web only document 69 would have the complete case study, whatever we did find with them. And uh, you can could, you could check that out online. OK, cool. Thank you. Um, the next question here, um, any best practices for managing bike lockers at park and rides? I believe that we had a bit of information in the report about bike lockers. But bike parking in general at park and rides wasn't something that was touched on in detail. Um, Jonathan or Todd, do you recall anything specific about well, it? I, mean, I did a quick control F search through the TCRP 192, and um, bike racks and lockers are used by several agencies. For example, Calgary Transit, RTD in Denver, and Houston Metro. Um, so they're, they're present. Um, in terms of best practices for managing them, off the top of my head, I don't have an answer for that. Um, I think I can speak for the, the other two guys. This is Zach again. Um, feel free to follow up with us, and I think Casey's going to provide our contact information with specific questions, and we can help you locate the answer either in the guidebook or maybe in some of our other work. Yeah, I'm sorry, my slide is a little frozen here, but yes, I'll make sure everyone gets your contact details after to uh, to be able to touch base with you on that. Uh, we ha still have another question pertaining to that. Uh, is there a way to acquire ownership of a park and ride that already exists? Are there any examples of this happening? I would say yes, and to the first answer that uh, certainly it has happened where the ownership of an existing facility changes, whether it's from a public entity or private entity to either the transit operator or uh, vice versa, the other direction. Um, and I'm sure we could go through our case studies and locate some specific peers. Uh, it sounds like this kind of question, the individual might be interested in kind of understanding where that might have happened, and we could help pull that information out. 
Um, in terms of the, the the process to do that, the specifics would, would be case dependent, but certainly we did have finding case studies where some agencies do both, uh, both own and lease or, or share, and some have tried to address a constraint in parking by looking for partners or to pay for their riders to have access to a nearby facility. And so um, there's, there are certainly examples of that. The, the last one I just shared, CT Fast Track in Connecticut with their BRT line has constrained right-of-way for their stations, and so the parking is very limited, and they've tried to form agreements with local government, although that's been a challenge to use nearby garages uh, on a long-term basis. Okay. Um, and then one more here, uh, and we'll wrap it up. Can an agency that doesn't have sole ownership of a park and ride install CCTV to monitor use and provide a, a level of security? Um, this is Zach. I think, as Jonathan mentioned with some of those other examples, it would probably be case by case and depend on, on who owns and the agreement between the owner and the user, i.e. the transit agency. Um, but my understanding is that in Port Authority, in the case of Port Authority, they actually use some private facilities that have closed circuit TV installed as part of their security. So I think there's some examples of it being done. Um, that might be something and, that's a little more specific than the guidebook, though. So again, uh, shoot us an email with that question if you want, and we can. Well, and on. on a related note, also real real quick is uh, Fort Bend County. This may not even be in the guidebook, but we know from other work that, for example, there's a small urban kind of uh, fringe regional provider that provides park and ride in the Houston area, Fort Bend County Public Transit, and they contract all their spaces from movie theaters or from a, a university campus. And that, in the movie theater case, they actually had installed uh, separate lighting controls, a electrical meter loop, and some other amenities in that part of the parking lot for a while it's being used as a park and ride during the day. And I, I don't know in their case that they went as far as security, uh, active CCTV. However, that's a very similar kind of agreement where uh, a, the, the operator is working with the parking owner to install, to change their infrastructure as part of the operating agreement. So it's certainly feasible. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, like I said, we'll be able to give out some contact information after this event. Um, please make sure you fill out the survey. Uh, we appreciate all of you having uh, being on the call today, and thank you again to all of our presenters uh, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you all very much. Thank you for the opportunity. You all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.